evening to our friends in Asia and good morning to our honored chair in Toronto. We are back again with a brand new session of ACNS webinars. The topic for today is very unique and exciting. The discovery of embryonic stem cells and their ability to self-renewate and differentiate into a variety of functional cells has sparked a lot of interest in the researchers. When successful, this form of therapy could become one of the greatest inventions to cure debilitating neurodegenerative disorders where neurons are lost. To teach us more about this, we have our honored speaker from, from Japan, Professor Jun Takahashi. Professor Takahashi is a professor and deputy chair of Center for IPS Cell Research and Application, Saira, Kyoto University, Japan. As a physician scientist, he has led groundwork for the clinical application of IPS cells by developing effective differentiation protocols for dopaminergic neurons. Based on these achievements, he started the world's first clinical trial for Parkinson's disease using IPS cells in 2018. It is our great honor to have him as a speaker for our webinars and are so thankful to him for accepting our invitation. The chair for this session of webinars is one of the world leaders of neuromodulation therapy, Professor Morgan Hodai. She is currently an Associate Professor of Surgery and Surgical Co-Director of Joy and Toby Tannenbaum Gavan Radio Surgery Unit at the Toronto Western Hospital, Canada. Dr. Hodai is affiliated with the Institute of Medical Sciences Faculty of Medicine as an Associate Member. She has pioneered and enlisted international collaboration in the application of new educational tools in the field of neurosurgical education in the developing world, focusing on structured online course modules in neurosurgery. Professor Hodai heads the Hodai Lab, which excels in the study of pain and has been recognized with multi-year peer-reviewed funding, including operative grants from CHIR and Multiple Sclerosis Society. We are so grateful to Professor Hodai for accepting our invitation to chair this webinar. On behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President of Yoko Gato, I would like to sincerely welcome today's speaker for the first session, Professor Jun Takahashi, and the Chair, Professor Morgan Hodai, to this online platform of ACNS webinars. Dr. Liu Boon Seng from Malaysia is my co-host for today. And with that introduction, may I please hand over this platform to Professor Hodai. It really is a pleasure to participate again with uh, our friends uh, and uh, be able to um, pair this seminar with this uh, extremely interesting topic by Dr. Jun Takahashi. Dr. Takahashi is a professor and a deputy director of the Center for IPS Cell Research and Application in Kyoto. He graduated from the Kyoto uh, University Faculty of Medicine and then went on to uh, have his career as a neurosurgeon in Kyoto uh, earning also his PhD and a postdoctoral fellow in uh, the USA at the Salk Institute. Uh, Dr. Takahashi is a functional neurosurgeon uh, with expertise in deep brain simulation as well as research in the area of uh, stem cell therapy in Parkinson's disease, uh, where uh, in, at his institution he has uh, really uh, laid the groundwork and the clinical application for IPS cells for the development of effective uh, differentiation protocols for dopaminergic neurons and how these uh, can advance uh, survival of transplant cells and uh, lead to better uh, treatments uh, for Parkinson's disease. I'm uh, really looking forward uh, to uh, this talk, Dr. Takahashi, and I'll be happy to mod uh, moderate uh, the uh, uh, questions thereafter. If you could please uh, share your screen. Okay, thank you very much for your introduction, Dr. Hotai. Hotai. <laughs> Hello, my name is Jun Takahashi from Center for IPS Cell Research and Application, Kyoto University, Kyoto, Japan. I would like to thank for inviting me to the Asian Congress of Neurological Surgeons. Today, I would like to talk about IPS cell-based therapy for Parkinson's disease. As you know, Parkinson's disease is caused by progressive degeneration of dopaminergic neurons in the substantial neighbor midbrain. It causes motor symptoms including akinesia, rigidity, and tremors. Its main cause is loss of dopaminergic neurons, and it's progressive. So, 
that the early stage medical treatment to repress the L-dopa is effective, but at certain time point, medical treatment cannot control the symptoms. That is the reason why we need a cell replacement of lost dopaminergic neurons by cell transplantation. As far as I confirmed, there are three clinical trials for Parkinson's disease in the world. The first one is performed by Cytotherapeutics in Australia. It started in March 2016. They use pathogenic stem cells and differentiate the neural stem cells for cell transplantation. The second one is performed by Chinese Academy of Science in China. It started in May 2017. They used embryonic stem cells and neural stem cells. The third one is our case. It is performed in Kyoto University, Japan. It started August 2018. We use human iPS cells and differentiate the dopaminergic neurons. It's precisely, it's the dopaminergic progenitor cells. This image was taken from the website of Cyto Therapeutics. This clinical trial is performed at the Royal Melbourne Hospital in Melbourne, Australia. In this website, they explain about the mode of action of their cells. And there are two ways. One is neurotrophic support and immunomodulation. It is the cytokine effect. Another one is cell replacement. So in, they inject the neural stem cells into the putamen and the grafted cells differentiate into the dopaminergic neurons in the brain and function as dopaminergic neurons. So there are two ways. And the Chinese case is supposed to be the similar or the same. As you may know, there is one more clinical application. But this is not a clinical trial but a compassionate use of the iPS cells derived dopaminergic neurons. See, they, they use the patient derived iPS cells for the autologous transplantation. And it is formed in Harvard University, United States. So this is a case report of 69 years old man with a 10-year history of progressive idiopathic Parkinson disease. So they induced the dopaminergic neurons and grafted into bilateral putamen. So this graph shows the change of the mds UPDRC part three. It means the motor function of the patient before and after cell transplantation. And as you can see here, the patient motor function mildly improved after cell transplantation. And this image shows the PET study for f doper to evaluate the dopamine synthesis by the grafted cells before and after transplantation. And as you can see here, there are a slight increase of the uptake of f doper after surgery. So that means the grafted cells survived and function as dopaminergic neurons in the patient brain. This is our case. We are performing the clinical trial in Kyoto University. It's allogenic transplantation of human iPS cell derived dopaminergic progenitor cells. 
So by these clinical trials, we are trying to cross the body of this. That means that we are trying to apply the results of basic research to the clinic. And in this process, I think there are three important points. One is scientific rationality. The second one is preclinical study. The third one is clinical trial. I will explain each of them. The first, it's scientific rational. It is solid data to support efficacy and safety in animal disease models. But first of all, we have to think about how we can induce functional dopaminergic neurons. The midbrain dopaminergic neurons originate from plate of the midbrain. So we need to induce the ventral midbrain. This is how we can induce the dopaminergic progenitor cells from pluripotent stem cells. Briefly, we can induce the neural epithelium by inhibiting both BMP and nodal activin signals. It is called dual SMAD inhibition. And then we induce ventral metencephalon by adding FGF8 or WINT or sonic hedgehog. It is called fluoroplate based differentiation. So by this process, we can induce the dopaminergic neurons. But thing is not so simple. As you know, the culture of cells contains variety of cells. It is not homogeneous, but heterogeneous. So when induce the dopaminergic neurons, the culture of cells may contain undifferentiated iPL cells or neural stem cells. And there might be a other type of neurons which causes uh, dyskinesia or non-neural lineage cells, which might be tumorigenic. And very mature dopaminergic neurons are too fragile, so these cells cannot survive during the cell transplantation process. So by previous reports, we know that the dopaminergic progenitor cells is most suitable for cell transplantation. But it is difficult to enrich or purify these dopaminergic progenitor cells. So we use the technique of cell sorting. For the cell sorting, we took advantage of choline. Choline is not a specific marker for dopaminergic neurons, but a fluoroplate marker. As I mentioned before, midbrain dopaminergic neurons originate from midbrain fluoroplate. So we induce ventral midbrain as much as possible and sort the choline positive cells. And this is the result. We induced the ventral midbrain and grafted the unsorted cells or choline positive cells into the rat brain. As you can he hear, we can identify the grafted cells by immunostaining for human nucleus. But in the case of the choline positive cell graft, there are more Th positive cells. Th is tyrosine hydroxylase, a marker for dopaminergic neurons. So we can enrich the dopaminergic neurons by sorting choline positive cells. By doing this, we have established the production protocol of the dopaminergic progenitor cells from iPL cells. The first step is feeder-free neuronal induction. I don't have enough time here, but this is the attachment culture on laminin 511 fragment. And the second one is sorting of choline positive cells. By doing this, we can purify the midbrain dopaminergic progenitor cells. And also, 
we can remove the proliferating cells, which may cause tumors. So, the cell sorting is very good for the efficacy and also safety of the cell production. And uh, by these rat experiments, we can confirm that the choline protein cells resulted in smaller graft but more dopaminergic neurons. As the next step, we performed a monkey study. Here, a monkey is not a large sized mouse but a small sized human. And the point is, this is not just a scale up but a simulation of human clinical trial. This is the scheme of our study. We, we induce the dopaminergic neurons from the iPS cells taken from the healthy individuals. And also, we use the patient-derived iPS cells. And then, we sort the choline positive cells. For the monkey, we used Sinomorgus monkeys, and we administered MPTP which can kill the dopaminergic neurons specifically. And then uh, we can make the Parkinson's disease model monkeys. And we grafted these choline positive dopaminergic progenitor cells into bilateral putamen of the monkeys. And then we performed long-term analysis, including behavioral analysis and imaging. And finally, we perform the histological analysis of the brains. For the evaluation of neurological function, we made this kind of scales, like facial expression or motility or tremor or gait. And this graph shows the change of the scores before and after cell transplantation. And higher number means severe deterioration. This black line shows the control monkey with only vehicle. The control monkey shows a little change after cell transplantation, but these two, I mean, the, this line shows a monkey with Parkinson disease patient drive cells. And this blue line shows the monkey with healthy individual derived cells. In both cases, the monkey shows the gradual improvement of the neurological scores. And the improvement ratio was about 40 to 50 percent in one year. This is a PET study to validate the dopamine synthesis. So if this is F doper for the dopamine synthesis and PE2I, this is the ligand for the dopamine transporter. So this is for the dopamine reuptake. As you can see here, before cell transplantation, this is a uh, monkey, uh, MPTP treated monkey. So the uptake of these ligands are very, very uh, little. But after cell transplantation, the uptake of both FDOPA and PE2I increased like this. So that means the grafted cells survived and functioned as dopaminergic neurons here. After two years of observation, we performed the histological analysis by doing the immunostaining for tyrosine hydroxylase. This is a control monkey, so we destroy the dopaminergic neurons by MPTP. The TH staining is very faint. But in the case of the monkeys with cell transplantation, you can see the dense staining of TH. This is the place of cell injection, and this is a higher magnification. So you can see the cell body and also the dense neurites. So the grafted cells are located here, but these cells extended neurites to cover the whole tamen here. And the size and shape are very similar to
to the host dopaminergic neurons in the substantia nigra. And the number of survived dopaminergic neurons is very important. And in our case, the average number of TH positive cells were 64,000 cells per hemisphere. It means 130,000 cells per monkey. So this number is supposed to be enough to expect the improvement of the symptoms. Another concern is safety, especially for the tumor formation. So to evaluate the graph size, we perform the TH weight MRI. So this graph shows the change of graph size. At the beginning, the graph size increased like this. But this is not a proliferation of the graph disease cells, but a small movement outwards of the grafted cells. But in about one year, the change of the graft size uh, ceased and become stable. And even the largest one is less than 100 millimeter cubic. It, so it is very, very small. So this small graft cannot compress the surrounding neuron, neurons. And also this HE staining of the brain slices showed that there was no abnormal findings, including the dividing cells. So we confirmed the safety of the cells. Based on these rodent and monkey studies, we went on to the preclinical study. This is the safety and efficacy studies with a clinical cell line. This is our manufacture process of the dopaminergic progenitors from the iPS cells. In this process, we check the cells in three points. One is iPS cells. The second one is coin-sorted cells. The third one is, of course, final product. At the beginning, we evaluate the iPS cells. Of course, it's GMP-grade iPS cells for the corny shape or the surface markers or karyotype or uh, genomic analysis. And also, we confirm the, the ratio of corine positive cells when we sort the corine positive cells. And also, we check the quality of the final products. So I will explain later. This is the matrix for quality check of the final product. So this is how we think about safety and efficacy. So there are both cellular and non-cellular components in the final product. And for the safety, the cellular component is non-target cells, especially the cells which may form tumors. For the efficacy, most important one is, of course, active cells, the dopaminergic progenitor cells. And in the non-cellular components, for example, the process-derived impurities or non-target bioactive substances or bacteria and so on. Okay. So this is a control checklist of the final product. As I mentioned before, the most important one is active cells and that is dopaminergic progenitor cells in our case. And we define the dopaminergic progenitor cells as FOXA2 and TUJ1 double positive cells. And these cells should be more than 80%. And non-target cells are undifferentiated iPS cells or early neural stem cells 
or transform cells. So these cells should not be contained in the final product. So we confirm this by these criteria, like uh, OCT3 or TRA T49 should be less than 0.1%, or SOX1 or PAC6 positive cell should be less than 0.1%. And also, this final product should be sterile and virus-free, of course, and no residual plasmid, and no dangerous mutation in the list of cancer-related genes. Uh, this is the cosmic uh, cancer-related gene list. And also, Japanese government have made a list of cancer-related genes. So we confirm that no dangerous mutation here. So that was the in vitro uh, analysis. And of course, we performed the in vivo study. So this is a toxicity and tumorigenicity test. By injecting the final product to the striatum of the NOG mice, this is a severely immunodeficient mice. And we grafted the final product and observed 52 weeks. That means about one year after cell transplantation. And uh, this, uh, this is the sample number. And after the observation, uh, this is the HE staining. So as you can see here, there was no graft overgrowth and no malignant findings. And also, uh, there was no metastasis to other organs and no graft-related toxicity. So that means we could confirm the safety of the final product. This is another study. Uh, it's a tumorigenicity spike test by injecting the cells into the subcutaneous space of the immunodeficient mice. We injected the cells, the Z cells, uh, HERA cells. This is a positive control. This is a, a famous cancer cell line. And this is very old iPS cell line established by using the retrovirus and also CMIC. So these positive control formed tumors in the subcutaneous space. But when we inject the our final product, dopamine progenitor cells, or with uh, these percentage of the iPS cells, uh, none of them uh, form the tumors in subcutaneous spaces. So by doing this, uh, we could confirm the safety and efficacy of our final products, clinical grade final product. Based on the results of the preclinical studies, we could get an approval for the regulatory agency of the Japanese government and also uh, institutional IRB. So then we could start a clinical trial. We started the recruitment of the patient in August 2018, and the first surgery for the patient was performed in October 2018. But the Japanese government allowed us to perform the surgery one by one for the first patient with the six months interval. So the first surgery for the one side was performed October, and but the second surgery for the other side was performed in June 2019. And from the second patient, we were allowed to do the bilateral surgery. So the surgery for the second patient was performed in September 19. And the surgery for the third patient was performed in October 2019. But as you know, the because of the COVID-19, uh, we cannot perform the surgery 
for the patient this year. So I hope we could start resume the clinical trial as soon as possible. But anyway, so this is the outline of our clinical trial. First, we get the blood sample from the healthy volunteer at the Kyoto University Hospital, and then we establish the clinical grade IPL cells uh, at our institute, Thyra. And then we induce the dopaminergic progenitor cells and perform the quality check. And if it's okay, so we transfer the cells to the Kyoto Universal Hospital again, and the neurosurgeons will transplant to the patient. And neurologist at the hospital will perform the evaluation of the safety and efficacy after cell transplantation. And we are using the HA homozygous donor cells. So such uh, 75 homozygous donor cells can cover 80% of Japanese population and most frequent HA haplotype can cover 17% of Japanese population. So now we are using the most frequent HA haplotype. This is inclusion criteria. Of course, the patients are Parkinson's disease patients and are controllable by medical treatment alone. Age, it's uh, 50 to 69 and they are suffering from Parkinson's disease more than five years. And scale, it's three to five at the off stage and one to three at the on stage. So that means the patient uh, at the moderate stage of the Parkinson's disease and patient should be responsible for the, the FDOPA. Design. It is phase one, two study and it is performed at the single institute, Kyoto University Hospital, non-randomized, often, and no control groups. So we will compare before and after cell transplantation. Number of patients is seven. But as I mentioned before, for the first patient, uh, the surgery was performed one by one. Surgical procedure. So we will set the Lexel stereotactic frame like this. And for this uh, transplantation, we have developed a long, thin needle, which can be attached to this frame. And we will inject the cells uh, through this needle. And under general anesthesia, and make a bar hold, we inject the cell to the bilateral putamen. And this is allergenic transplantation. So we will give um, immunosuppressant drugs. It is tacrolimus for one year. So this is how we set the targets. So before surgery, we perform the F-DOPA PET and we identify the area where the amount of L-DOPA is decreased. And we set the injection point here, and we calculate the trajectories by using this system. And we inject the spheres, not the suspended cells. So we make the cells spheres, and the amount of the spheres is about 400 uh, micrometers and we inject these spheres by this needle to the target and uh, in our case we set the three trajectories and four points in each trajectories so that means in total we inject the 12 points per hemisphere and one point 
we inject the 200,000 cells in one microliter. So that means we inject about 2.4 million cells per hemisphere and about 5 million cells per person. Follow-up and endpoint. So follow-up period is two years and primary endpoint is for safety. Uh, so we evaluate the adverse events, especially for the tumor formation and also dyskinesia or hemorrhage and so on. And the secondary endpoint is related to the efficacy. So we will evaluate the MDS UPDRS score or of time period and so on. And we think more objective evaluation is important. So we will perform the PET study. These three types of PET study. One is f doper this is for dopamine synthesis. So this is uh, from the uh, monkey study. So by this, so we can confirm the function of the dopaminergic neurons. Another one is uh, GE180. This is a ligand for the translocator expressed on the activated microglia. So this means the information so this is image from the patient of the multiple sclerosis. So this uptake means the information is occurring in the brain. So we can monitor the immune response after cell transplantation by this bed. The third one is FLT. This is for cell proliferation. This is the, the image from the malignant brain tumor. So this uptake means the proliferating cells in the tumor. And also we will perform the dead scan, that scan, to evaluate the function of dopamine transporter. So these two are for the function of dopaminergic neurons of the grafted cell. Okay, so Anyway, so our clinical trial is ongoing and we will have the outcome in three years or four years. But in the future, I think the therapy has to be improved as a second version or third version. And for that purpose, I think the host environment will be important because the cell-based therapy is a collaborative work of the donor cells and the host brain. And for the better host environment, I think the combination with the medical treatment or gene therapy or rehabilitation can be possible. For example, this is our study of the combination of cell transplantation and medical treatment. In this study, we compared the pre-existing drugs such as valproic acid and zonisamid and estradiol. So we injected into the intraperitoneal space after cell transplantation and we compared the survival or maturation of the grafted cells. And we found that zonisamid promoted the cell survival and maturation of the grafted cells. As you may know, zone summit is used for the treatment of Parkinson's disease. So it is possible that we will compa combine the medical treatment and cell transplantation. Next, we try to find the mechanism of the effect of zone summit. For that purpose, we injected control saline or zonisamid into the peritoneal space of the mice and after seven days we analyzed the in gene expression profile with or without zonisamid. We got several candidates but anyway so we found that expression of street RK6 is 
increased in the brain with zonisamide treatment. This shows the structure of sweet alkane. This is composed of uh, loisin rich repeat and also the truck. It is a neutrophic factor receptor. And uh, sweet alkane 6 uh, was expressed not the spiny neuron, but the cholinergic neurons in the striatum. So the detailed function will be explored in the future. This is another our trial for the combination of cell transplantation and rehabilitation. In this study, we set four groups of rats. One is control group, do nothing. The second one is uh, with treadmill training for five weeks. The third one is only cell transplantation. And the final one is the combination of cell transplantation and treadmill training. And we found that the treadmill training increased the cell survival of the dopaminergic neurons, like this. And also, we found that the treadmill training increase the neurite length from the craft. For more details, we analyze the direction of the neurite extension. We divided the four areas. One is dorsolateral or dorsomedial or ventrolateral or ventromedial. And we found that the treadmill training promoted the neurite extension. Only the direction for the dorsolateral striatum. In other areas, there was tendency of the neurite extension, but there is no statistically difference. So we discussed the reason of the, these results and we referred to this paper and in this paper they say that the neurons from the motor cortex especially from the trunk or lower limbs connect to the those lateral areas of the striatum so it is possible that the locomotor motion or rehabilitation make some signals in this area and it attracts the neurite extension from the grafted cells. This is another example of the combination of cell transplantation and gen therapy. This is not our study, but a study from uh, Dr. Parrish's lab in Australia. And they grafted the dopaminergic neurons into the striatum and then added the GF, GDNF expressing adeno associated virus into the dorsolateral region of the striatum. And they found that, that these uh, treatments increase the dopaminergic innovation and the dopaminergic maturation and dopamine synthesis and increase the function of the dopaminergic neurons. This is the figure. So, uh, as you can see here, the GDF uh, treatment with uh, gene therapy increase the extension of the neurite here, and also cell survival and function of the dopaminergic neurons. Current therapies include medical treatment, gene therapy, or devices and rehabilitation. But now we have cells, so we can expect the cell replacement by cell transplantation. And as I showed you today, the gene therapy and medical treatment or rehabilitation or maybe devices can promote the effect of the grafted cells by improving the survival 
maturation and neural extension and maybe synapse formation. So, in these strategies, the concept of drugs or gene therapy and device rehabilitation may be changed. So this is a cell-based therapy. So this is the, my final message that regenerative medicine is a total work of art. It's not just a putting cells into the brain or organs. Finally, it's acknowledgement. I introduce the main prayer in each studies in my talk, but of course, our studies were supported by other much more people, much more researchers like this. And also, our clinical trials are supported by a lot of uh, medical doctors or co-medicals and also companies and of course the patients. So I would like to thank all of these people in this occasion. Thank you very much for your attention. Takahashi, thank you very much for a uh, fantastic overview on uh, the role of <clears throat> cell transplantation for the treatment of Parkinson's disease. I very much enjoyed your talk. Thank you. um, I would like to open uh, the opportunity for okay. questions uh, from uh, the audience. And I will start with one question myself, if that's okay. Okay. Uh, when you treat these patients, what is uh, the schedule of imaging? When you do, uh, when do you do an MRI, and um, do you continue to do MRIs on a, um, a yes, specific a timeline? Yes. Yes. Uh, of course, before the surgery, and also like uh, one month, six months, one year, one mm -hmm. and a half year, and second final. And are there any schedule. key sequences that you find are uh, um, particularly helpful? For instance, uh, do you do MR spectroscopy in these patients? Ah, uh, no, 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 J just a, just a regular MRI. Just a regular and, MRI. Uh, yes, and three types of PET. Mm -hmm. PET study. Yes. I see. Very mm. good. Any questions from the audience for Dr. Takahashi? I think there may be many questions. Uh, I if it is possible, we can skip the questions from the audience at the later. Is that fine? Of course, yes. Thank you so much, Professor Takahashi. Thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. This opened up our minds to a new window of opportunity into stem cell okay. research and therapy mm -hmm. that we were not aware of. As neurosurgeons, we are exclusively into tumors, trauma, etc. But this was a wonderful opportunity to learn from you. Thank you so much. We can proceed to our next lecture. We have with us Professor uh, Jiwan Nuribe as well as Professor Yuachi Mortel. Thank you so much for joining. So we have our second speaker for today, who is one of the most celebrated faculty in the spine surgery, Professor Yuan Nuribe. Professor Nuribe is the Chief of uh, Division of Spinal Disorders, Walter Sontag Chiarak Spine Research and Vice Chairman of Neurosurgery at the Barron Neurological Institute, Phoenix, Arizona. He is a board certified by the American Board of Uribe's expertise includes surgical treatment of scoliosis, spine trauma, and spinal tumors, particularly with minimal invasive spine surgery. He is a member of many societies like uh, ANS, CNS, NASS, and uh, Society of Lateral Access Surgery and Scoliosis Research. Professor Uribe is a well-known research scientist and has published several articles in various peer-reviewed journals. He has been honored with many awards for his outstanding contribution towards spinal surgery. We are indeed so honored to have him today as a second speaker at our webinars. Professor Urbe is going to speak about MIS, single position circumferential prone lateral interbody fusion, indication, surgical techniques, and clinical application. To chair this session of the webinar, we are joined by Professor Yuichi Mortel, who is a professor and chair of neurosurgery, University of Saarland, Hamburg, Saar, Germany. He is the vice president of the International Society of Minimally Invasive Spine Surgery. He is an author research author who has published more than 150 original peer reviewed chapters articles and 800 per presentations on medical conferences. His wide experience include 8,000 procedures in a carrier spanning from 96 to 2018, particularly 
He is experienced in minimally invasive spine surgery, but also skull-based tumors and vascular neurosurgery and pediatric neurosurgery as well. We are indeed so thankful for him to our, accepting our invitation to chair this webinar. On behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President of CEO Kukata, I would like to sincerely welcome the second speaker for today, Professor Yuan Uribe and the Chair, Professor Yuaichi Mortel, to this online platform of ACNS webinars. With that introduction, may I please hand over the podium to Professor Mortel. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, I think we, should, we should just way. proceed because yes. we're a little bit behind schedule. <laughs> okay, Dr. Oribe, please start. So thanks very much for the invitation. Um, I will try to be limited since uh, time now is a little bit uh, limited from our side. And uh, today what I'm going to do is a um, give us a good overview of something that actually we are trying to push right now and uh, utilize more on uh, spine surgery, which is uh, trying to be more efficient and using less invasive techniques, actually try to save time and be more efficient. So that's what we call the single position surgery. And this is more dedicated to the thoracolumbar and lumbar spine. So basically we do lateral surgeries of anterior surgeries and at the same time doing the posterior part without the need to do it on stages. It means like uh, taking the patient uh, from one position to the other one. So it is a significant advantage of uh, this option. Uh, obviously when you do lateral surgery to the spine, you um, are always relying on indirect decompression which is just opening the disc spaces and getting some um, enough neural decompression. And then obviously when you do it that way, uh, you leave most of the posterior tension band intact. Obviously, if you don't deal with the dura, you don't have potential for durotomies and CSF leaks. And obviously you're trying to keep and restore the physiological delordosis. So the question is, who has some benefits when you do single position surgery? So obviously the biggest one is time. And as we know, time is one of the few things that um, uh, the human being is always looking to save. So obviously money is good, knowing that the health systems are super expensive across the globe. And obviously anesthesia is easier since there is no need to move in the patient. So I'm going to try to show you here a little video. Um, hopefully um, it will go. So showing a one example of um, single position surgery uh, using a, a prone position and lateral access and at the same time percutaneous scoop raisement. So this is a patient who had a previous surgery, uh, the L4, L5 level that uh, then developed a, a proximal segment uh, stenosis as we see on the MRI and significant, significant stenosis. In this case, for example, just obtain truly indirect decompression by opening the, this space and placing the cages, it was probably not enough. So this was a good um, setup when uh, doing a lateral interbody fusion and posterior decompression at the same time was a good option. So we see here the patient is placed in prone position. In this case, in one of the Jackson tables, you make your uh, lateral incision which obviously we're trying to do as smaller as possible. Then you dissect the abdominal muscles, you go to the retroperitoneum, then you map the uh, lumbar plexus. This is just a schematic representation of the lumbar plexus in a cadaveric dissection. Then you continue your uh, dilation of the psoas muscle, then you put the retractor, but notice that at the same time, I have the a assistant surgeon working on the posterior approach at the same time that I'm doing the lateral axis, so which saves a lot of time. So once he get with the special posterior, the critical parts of the lateral obviously is a one person uh, part. As you see here, you prepare the disc space, you um, perform a good discectomy, and then uh, you place your the implant as you see on the insert, the implant is going through it. 
So once you place your interval infusion at the same time now, the uh, posterior part now is replacing the previous screws that were there, placing the new ones. And we see here on the screen on the left, on the right, pre and post-op with an adequate uh, decompression, good interval infusion, and then the picture on the right without compromising the long valor doses. So I'm gonna go with more details in the next uh, views. So as you see, when you do a lateral surgery, you rely on indirect decompression as we look in here. However, in some cases like the one that I just showed, uh, the need is actually doing a um, indirect decompression. So in using this case, for example, in this insert, patient with spondylolisthesis grade one, uh, significant a uh, disc space, um, diminishing and then by placing the cage and expanding, increasing the disc height, actually you get a good indirect decompression as we see here. Once you reduce the spondy and you get some disc height as you see here, you actually get indirect decompression just by that. So this is, uh, but sometimes it doesn't work as you saw in the, on the video before and then actually you need to do the laminectomies. Okay, so what are again the uh, advantages of this uh, single position surgery? One is obviously smaller incisions. You don't want this big, uh, what we call traditional big incision when you have to go to everything. So you have less tissue mobilization. You have obviously doing the good interbody fusion. You have more surface for fusion compared, for example, the small implants of the tea leaves. Uh, you put a really good cages, biomechanics are very good. And then obviously uh, what we like a lot is we say OR time and we have some at the end healthcare savings. So um, I'm gonna show you two more cases. I know that we limited on time and I don't want to take advantage of you. So in this case, for example, how do you do when you have to deal with L5S1 that is included on the surgery? So obviously you cannot do prone anterior lumbar interval infusion. I mean, unless someone comes with that, but it's complicated. So for 5-1, or you go supine and do the A-leaf, or you go pro prone and do like a posterior lateral fusion. In this case, I'm gonna show you how we do single position surgery, doing interval fusions using the A-leaf and the lateral axis, and at the same time, be able to use uh, pedicle screws. So in this case, we have a, a middle-aged person, 68-year-old person with significant comorbidities. Uh, this patient has a previous <laughs> measurements, and then now is a uh, severe back pain. So these are the scoliosis films, which show that the patient is, is within sagittal balance. These are pre-op MRIs as you see here. Uh, the laminectomy area at 4-5 and then developing the transitional level at 3-4. Uh, uh, this is the CT preoperative. You see here the area of the previous laminectomy, now developing a spondylar stasis at 5 and a zone retral at 3-4. So we decided that this patient probably the best option was fusing 3-1 and uh, using a single position surgery. So in this patient is on lateral position. This is the a, um, a left side up. So this is the midline on the front. So you see the incision going to 5-1, doing the A-leaf on 5-1. Once you do the 5-1 uh, uh, A-leaf, then you go from the side and you put the cages on 3-4 and 4-5. Then once you do that, as we look on the insert, with the patient still on the lateral position, you place your pedicle screws on the lateral position and uh, you pass your rod as you see here. And then uh, actually you can perform a really good circumferential surgery as you see here, five one eight leaf, lateral four five, lateral three four, and then the placement of the pedicle screws, all of them on a single lateral position using here uh, pre and post most importantly we are not losing lordosis and we are providing a really good circumferential anterior interbody fusion and a good instrumentation using pericle screws so basically biomechanically 
probably this is the strongest construct that we can create. You know, cages that go from one diaphysis to the other one, and obviously pedicle screws that goes uh, to the three columns and doing in a single position in a less invasive option. Okay, so what about adult spinal deformity? Can you use the a lateral prone position of these patients? So I'm gonna show you an example of that. So uh, first thing that comes is, which we always try to say, uh, is there really advantages of doing the surgery in this way? So the answer is obviously uh, why we like prone lateral position is because when you are placing your pedicle screws, that is not easier to put pedicle screws than the patient in prone position. The case that I showed before, we put it on lateral position, but the lateral position, when you put pedicle screws is not the natural way for the screws. The screws, as we know, all of us, they're easy to put with the patient in prone. So that's a good, good advantage when you do lateral and you put the screws on prone. And then obviously, if you want to do some direct decompression, if you don't think just opening the, this space is enough to provide decompression, you have right away the solution to do your laminectomy. Uh, obviously, um, one more thing that is very important is that actually the prone position is very friendly for navigation and robotics. You know, when you have the patient in lateral position, the patient tends to move and you can uh, lose navigation easily. But when you have the patients in prone position, it's a very stable position and the uh, navigation tends to work uh, very good. Obviously had these disadvantages, you know, the ergonomics, you know, doing the prone position lateral is complicated because you're sitting instead of being standing and your head is a little bit, so it's, it's, it's a little bit ergonomics can be complicated. Uh, managing the pelvis, breaking the table when accessing four or five can be complicated in prone position because it's hard to break. And uh, obviously the a, uh, approach lateral on prone position is a little bit counterintuitive. However, a, um, it tends uh, to work very good. So I'm gonna show you the example. This is a woman with a, a mild um, adult spinal deformity and mild scoliosis as you see here on the coronal plane and uh, very little uh, disbalance on the sagittal balance. In this case, we like uh, to apply the GAP scores. So you see that the GAP score is uh, six which is put you on moderate disproportion. So this patient actually needs some lower doses to be able to keep it um, on a, a good balance. Now, if you want to read more details, you see here on the right, exactly what is the ideal uh, calculation of the spine. And on the left, this is actually how the spine looks like. So based on the GAP score and the American Schwab way to do it, definitely this patient needs some lordosis. Again, this is a little bit of a close up, so you see better the extent of the deformity. So it's basically a mild deformity, which there is an allesthesis of four or five, and then a uh, definitely a flat lumbar area. So we want this spine going somehow this way. So you're looking here at the MRI pre-op, this is the classic MRI of adults of uh, spinal deformity, some a central stenosis, some foraminal stenosis, loss of this height, some this degeneration, some modic changes on the upper levels. So in this case, we decided that uh, probably L2, so L2 to one, we will probably uh, solve the big problem trying to be in the less invasive way. So we decided to do interbody fusions at two, three, three, four, four, five, and five, one, but we wanted to do it in a single position. So we put this patient, this is obviously for everybody in here to recognize, it's very important to know what is the bone density on every patient you're doing. So this patient actually bone density was not that bad. So then you see here, we put the patient in prone position. This is just showing, you know, the amount of taping that we put in order to open the side that we're going to do the approach so we can have access to L4, L5. 
So the patient in prone position. Now we start marking the each levels. Then again, we mark your our incisions and start dilating the abdominal muscles. Then once we go to the retroperitoneum, we put our dilators, marks the this space on the lateral, each space at a time. You see here how uh, we start trying to find out to get into the, this space little by little. As you see here, even the wire initially was kind of tight, but you find a way to get there. You put your retractor, then step by step, you start uh, working the this space until you put in this case your cage and you may start making some uh, correction. That's four, five, and then you keep moving. You go to the next level, three, four, which was a little easier space. We trying to keep and maintain the lordosis. Then when we go to one, two area, you have to be uh, careful at this level. As you see here, this was the level where the patient lost most of the lordosis with a significant collapse of the this space. In this case, actually, we perform an ACR. So an ACR means an anterior colon release. So we cut the anterior longitudinal ligament of the patient, and then we fish mouth the level. So you see here, and we use a 15 or 20 degrees lordotic cages to provide actually extra lordosis. So you see here in this level, actually, we went anterior a little bit, cut the anterior longitudinal ligament, keep dilating, and then we put that. Notice that that cage is the only one actually that had screws on it. And the reason is because when you cut the anterior longitudinal ligament, if we leave this cage alone, like the cage on three, four, and four, five, this cage can migrate anterior and fall into the retroperitoneum, which you don't want it. So that's why that cage has, they have these screws holding it up. The other ones don't need it because these cages, the anterior longitudinal ligament is intact. The posterior longitudinal ligament is intact. These cages are not going anywhere. So then uh, after that, we, in this case, we did the, the uh, intraoperative CT and then our preference is to place the screws uh, using navigation percutaneous, but obviously you can do it on the x-ray, it doesn't matter. And then uh, you place your percutaneous pericle screws as you see here. Then when the time comes to pass the rod, we like to use this system called Bendini that basically you register each screw and the computer kind of give you the uh, size and the bending of the rods. Uh, this is an AP showing the images. Then we pass the rod and uh, basically this is uh, the result. So this is the pre-op image as uh, you see here. We start on, on the CT with a 13 degrees of lordosis. Then you see here the post-op image, we get 36 degrees. So actually we gain significant amount of lordosis. And then um, this is just showing the placement of pericle screws. Uh, see how actually phi one normalized by itself. So then you see here doing L2 to L5, actually we were able to a, uh, obtain a, a good coronal correction and maintaining the lordosis in this patient do it in a single position. So in, in summary, the single position surgery, lateral prone, we believe that it's a safe and reproducible option for a significant group of patients. Um, we are happy with this procedure because we're saving a lot of time and money for the hospitals. Obviously, uh, this is a kind of a new variation of the a lateral approach. And uh, we wanted to make sure that in the future, this can be more reproduced and applied to the masses. Uh, we recently Publish our initial experience, which is in the a, a Journal of Neurosurgery um, Spine. And uh, the uh, paper actually showed that uh, we can do this procedure safe as we show you. So for more information, I, I invite you to read this paper that has uh, more details in terms of the technique, position, and how you do it. And I also invite you to, if you want to get more information, you can follow me on LinkedIn or Instagram where we put some of these cases. So uh, thanks uh, very much and I apologize for the timing. So now is um, to you guys.
Dr. Well, Orton. thank you very much. I think that's a very interesting uh, approach. So, um, so far, I mean, I, I understood that your, your experience is limited so far, but where do you think is the, is the limit? Uh, so you can go up until L1, is that right? Or is it more difficult for five? What, what is the limit in the, doing this single procedure in, in the prone position? So it's a great question. And I can tell you, uh, after doing a lot of laterals on lateral position, I see a lot of limitations as we do it right now in prone. For example, the, as you say, managing the ribs and opening the space between T12 rib and the iliac crest is not as efficient as when you have the patient on lateral. So that one limit a lot your access. Right now, as you see, we're doing the deformity cases that we do, they're very minimal. We are not really pushing too hard. Uh, obviously, uh, overweight patients, patients where the BMI is more than 35, is very deep going on the prone. So when you put the patient on lateral, the distance is very short because breaking the table, when you're in prone, they super deep and it becomes intimidating. So definitely there is a lot of uh, a new, I would say, uh, roadblocks that probably, hopefully we learn as we go. The other thing is the way that we see it is that we don't want the prone uh, lateral position or the prone lateral take over the lateral or the anterior position. We, we were thinking that it's just one more tool in your bag and you use it when you think it's, it, it works. So hopefully it's not here to take over the other surgeries. You know, still there is room for obviously tea leaves and everything else. So, so you think it's, it's an option and a selected number of patients for special, uh, special indication uh, to, to really save a lot of surgical time. Is that right? Exactly, yeah. For example, let's say for, uh, in my cases, uh, four or five grade one spondylolisthesis, which is a lot of you know, everyday case for every spine surgeon in the world, is becoming now my go-to case. You know, you put the patient in prone, you put the discectomy, put it right away. So for example, you know, I work in an academic institutions with residents and fellows, which surgery takes more than when you are set up by your own as a private practitioner. And normally a four or five doing lateral and then put the patient in prone, it will take me, you know, two hours and a half, sometimes three hours. Nowadays I can do it less than two hours in the same setup. So in other words, I'm saving time. And as, as I mentioned before, for all of us, time is amazing. You know, when you have extra time, you can spend more time with your family or you can do more research or you can go do hobbies, who knows, you know? And that's why we always buy, trying to buy time. <laughs> well, thank you. I think it was a wonderful presentation. Are there any questions from the audience? I would like to invite my co-host, Dr. Lubun Singh. Hello, Prof. John. Thanks for a very nice uh, presentation. I, I wish to ask uh, Professor, uh, uh, in terms of, uh, if you compare to uh, MIF tea leaf uh, to place the interbody fusion compared to your technique lateral uh, uh, cache placement with a uh, pedicle screw from posterior, uh, in terms of uh, surgical uh, difficulty and time span, uh, do, do they actually make uh, very much uh, differences? And if you come uh, from uh, lateral uh, body uh, uh, or cache uh, placement, do you allow to do a more compression when you put the pedicle screw uh, in MIA system that you show in the last case? Uh, sec second question is, of, uh, as, uh, in L5-S1, uh, do you think that the technical difficulty are more challenging uh, because of the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the pelvis, uh, the position of the pelvis that, that may, may obstruct from the lateral approach? Uh, and, uh, uh, my, my, my last question, uh, Professor, and uh, looking at uh, your technique uh, coming from laterally, uh, do you find that uh, it's more challenging to prepare the end, end plate uh, for the fusion? Thank you, Professor. Yeah, so uh, really good question, Dr. Lu. Um, I would say, yes, um, there's a couple of things. For example, a leaf with the patient on lateral is way more challenging than the A-leaf with the patient supine. And here in America, I'm not sure, you know, in America, we always use access surgeons for the A-leaf because legal purposes, uh, we're aware that all over the world is the spine surgeon who 
makes the approach in most of the places. So um, it's, 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 a, it's a brand new, uh, I would say, used to do way if you're trying to do A-leaves on lateral position compared to supine. So you, it needs like a get used to. Then the other thing is um, the reason that we, and at least in our group, we prefer to do more a A-leaf and lateral interbody fusions is because we deliver a really good uh, cages and grafts, you know, so it's very thorough and our fusion rates are amazing. And also we don't have too much subsidence that sometimes we see it with the tea leaves. Um, the downside is obviously you have to be a big believer in indirect decompression to be having a big volume on, on lateral interbody fusion and anterior interbody fusion. But I will say um, we still do T leaves. For example, five one cases when anterior exposure is not, we, we obviously do T leaves. And also, for example, this prone lateral, prone lateral position is great. For example, you do four, five or three, four lateral, and then you do five one T leaf, you know, in patients that they don't need a lot of oh, lordosis. So all these things open, I would say this is just opening a new avenue of options for treating you know and and as as we know in the spine is so variable that you know you can have 10 surgeons discussing one case and we can come with 10 different ways to do it you know thank you so much yes dr ajita nair okay very good presentation and uh, you have taken up to newer uh, venue so my question regarding is, uh, whenever we are uh, doing a degenerative dystrophy, we'll try to attain a, a, a pelvic incidence lumbar lordosis to correct the pelvic incidence lumbar lordosis mismatch. And there are two questions. Uh, there is a new message like a distal spinal lordosis is coming up. That should be equal to sacral slope. Which, which parameter you will uh, correct? Either lumbar lordosis PI mismatch or PI distal spinal lordosis. My second question is, whenever you are putting the cage and the contour in the road, how will you decide the con uh, contouring of the cord? Because you want to achieve a particular load of it. That how will you measure? Uh, in, can you measure it intraoperatively or uh, what are the techniques you use for that? Yeah, good question. So um, usually I tend to follow because we in America, the, the Schwab, uh, parameters, you know, lumbar lordosis, pelvic incidence, and pelvic tilt. But as you saw, uh, I like also to uh, see what the gap scores are. And uh, sometimes what we do, we make a average. What do you need between the both systems? Um, I can tell that uh, in, in a practical way, if I need more than 30 degrees of lordosis in, in some case, I end up doing or classic osteotomies, you know, like a PSO or PCOs, or I do what I show there, the ACR, you know, cut the anterior longitudinal ligament. If I need less than 30 degrees overall of lordosis, I actually try not to do at least PSO, like a big uh, osteotomies. I sometimes just go with facetectomies and the cages itself. Uh, the thing is that also, uh, depending how the disc space looks like. For example, if the disc space has vacuum phenomenon, those spaces tend to respond very good to cages with you know, 10, 15 degrees of lordosis because those space, spaces open better. You know, uh, also um, spaces that, these spaces that start with some uh, regional kyphosis obviously you can get a lot of lordosis on them because you start in negative. So each patient, we tend to see it individually, but in general, the rule of thumb is more than 30 degrees of lordosis, you have to do something, or traditional osteotomies or anterior column releases in order to be able to match the, the, and deliver a good lordosis. In that case, we'll wind up. I would like to go back to our chair, Professor Wertel, to give his concluding remarks. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. I particularly thank uh, Dr. Uribe for this uh, sharing uh, uh, with, with us his uh, ideas about being more efficient in the OR. And um, 
Well, I think I, I look really forward to to hear from from you with the, maybe when you did your first 50 cases or so, what your experience is, um, because I, I think particularly in the the more difficult cases, this will be very challenging. But I think it's very interesting because you save almost 50 percent of surgical time with this technique. So I think this was a wonderful presentation. I, I from my side, I perfectly understood the concept and the idea. And also I, I got a little bit idea of what, what pot, potential limitations would be. And well, I think uh, the auditorium, they, all the participants for the discussion. And I think um, we will continue with our series for the ACNS uh, webinars and um, hopefully we'll see you soon with the next webinar. Thank you thank all you, for, you. for participating. Thank you so much. Um, it's a really a pleasure to participate with all of you across the world, uh, Europe, uh, North America, Asia, and uh, I look forward to, uh, to uh, more opportunities where we can share our uh, thoughts and our experiences with the group. Thank you so much, Professor Takahashi, for joining. So I'll just wind this up officially on behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President, Professor Yoko Kaito. I sincerely thank today's speakers, Professor Jun Takahashi and Professor Yuan Oribe, as well as the Chairs, Professor Morgan Hodai and Professor Rachi Motel for coming here and spending their time and teaching us elaborately about their respective subspecialities. Uh, thank you, Dr. Liu Boon Singh, for being my co-host today. A special word of thanks to Professor Michael Lawton, the President and CEO of BNI USA, who readily agreed to partner with us for the webinars and suggested some wonderful speakers so that our young neurosurgeons will hear from one of the best in the art of neurosurgery. My sincere thanks to Professor Shubin from Shanghai, China, with, uh, with whose support we are able to reach far and wide corners of China. Today, prof, there were uh, two translators uh, who are colleagues of Professor Zhubin who joined, uh, Professor Feng Rui and Professor Fan Jian Lan, who broadcasted these webinars. And today we have 3,245 audiences who are who watching us live on uh, YouTube, WeChat, and Zoom. So it is a huge number. Thank you so much. So until next Saturday, it is bye-bye from all of us. Thank you all who joined. Thank you.